Okay. <clears throat> this is a presentation. It's going to be a virtual field trip or when we put this online from Andrew Sassi at the executive director of Kent Records and Tom Dumas, who is the HIPAA man, if I say that correctly. So please make sure that you ask your questions that you brought with you. And I'm going to turn this over first to Andrew Sassi. Hello. How is everyone doing today? Good. <laughs> We're good to go with audio? OK, good. I can't hear myself through the speaker, so just making sure. Uh, so records management and uh, regulatory overview for 2013. Um, I did this presentation with Tom uh, last semester, and we had a <coughs> blast doing it with the classes here at GRCC, and we've both presented um, to various other associations and groups on these topics. So uh, I hope today that you have a renewed interest in records and information management and understand where our uh, profession is going. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that um, coming out of college, I didn't run over to the first records management company and say, I want to work for you. It, did, it didn't work that way. You know, I was in IT and then naturally progressed into or evolved into records if you want to go that route. So um, we'll talk more about all of that. And then Tom, he'll tell his story when it gets to his, his portion, OK? A uh, little bit about uh, Kent Record Management, or as we are known in the community as Kent Records. How many folks have actually heard of Kent Records before? OK. Good. Um, well, we've got 30 plus years of business. We opened up in 1981. Originally, we were a moving and storage company. So uh, as time went on, we started collecting boxes to help our clients. Um, they didn't have a place to store records. And naturally, that became what we were best at. The moving and storage business was sold off. And uh, records, boxes, and tapes, and media, and now many other things are, are the core of what we do. We have five locations. Uh, Grand Rapids is our headquarters, Lansing, Kalamazoo, Muskegon, and Benton Harbor. Uh, we added on Muskegon and Benton Harbor uh, 10 days from each other in January of this year. So uh, it's been uh, quite, quite a ride already <coughs> for 2013 at Kent Records. Uh, primarily, we do off-site paper and media storage. So you can see the picture down here. Uh, if you ever get a chance to do a tour of our facility in Grand Rapids, which is right around the corner from West Catholic High School on Waldorf, um, it's uh, about half a million boxes at that facility. And then on the left side there, you can see the inside of our vault. It's kind of washed out a little bit, but you can see kind of a row of media tapes. So some of you may be, uh, have taken an IT class. Both servers get backed up to media or in the cloud in some cases. We do both. So we store tapes for customers and we rotate them off uh, site. Paper shredding and media shredding. So uh, we shred paper and uh, hard drives and tapes uh, have to be destroyed, uh, which Tom will touch base on in the regulatory side. Uh, document scanning, so paper, we convert that to digital images uh, so they can be viewed. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, before the days of Google Docs and Blackboard, uh, there were paper everywhere. And people uh, printed everything. And most of the time, it ended up at Ken Records. So we were certainly happy about that. But as our world has changed, it got more digital. We have a less paper coming in now. And when our customers want it back, they, in some cases, prefer it digital. So we had to adjust based on the need. And uh, as I referenced before, off-site electronic record and online backup service. So we've complemented our physical uh, services to uh, be able to take on the electronic service as well. So you can log into a secure website, view a scanned image that normally would have taken uh, a person in a vehicle uh, to drive that uh, to you. Um, and that doesn't work for some folks, and for others it works great. We have clients in the Upper Peninsula that that's their only option of receiving paper or records in a in a timely manner. Otherwise, you've got to load them up in a box and drive them up there. Uh, same concept for downtown Grand Rapids. It's quicker for us just to put them in a van and drive them downtown. It is what it is. But uh, chances are, if you've had medical work done, legal work <coughs> done, or if you've had any type of, uh, uh, we'll stick with uh, healthcare and, and legal, uh, those records are uh, housed with Kent Record Management. OK? Next slide. So uh, agenda, we're going to talk about records management, uh, at least from my perspective. Uh, I know, what, what part of the class are you guys in right now for records? Are you? We're just finished running the tenure of the refinery and the joint swap route. Uh, actually, our last chapter was electronic file management, and we're moving into uh, shipment management and procedures. 
Okay, did you guys talk about then taxonomies and classifications and metadata? Get into that for the electronic side? Not very much. Okay, all right, that's fine. We'll talk about that. Um, certified Records Manager, uh, how many people have actually heard of a CRM? Okay, that's good. You'll hear about it today. And then Tom's going to get into the regulatory issues facing the industry, so that'll be his section. That's a breakout of what we're going to talk about, and then he'll get more into the HIPAA side. So, next slide. All right, uh, you can go ahead and just show the whole slide, Tom. That's fine. Oh, okay, here we go. So, uh, this may be a recap, but records management is one of the world's oldest professions, um, unlike some of the other professions that are very old. Um, <laughs> this is the one that uh, I think is legal and, and will continue to be for quite some time. Uh, clay token systems emerged 10,000 years ago in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley when a nomadic lifestyle gave way to a more sedentary approach. So when folks would pick up and move very frequently because of weather or scenery or because of food and water, the other resources that were needed, and started living in more suburban or town type uh, environments, uh, you know, they used clay tokens to exchange and buy goods. So there had to be a record of those transactions or receipts and that's what kind of birth the advent of records management. You know, where do we keep a record of this transaction? How far back do we go? Uh, trivia, I know it's not geography class, but what country right now, modern day, is the Tigris and Euphrates Valley located in? Anyone want to take a guess? Nope. Nope. Close, but no. Nope. Very good. Modern day Iraq. So uh, Mesopotamia, that whole area, you know, where kind of the birth of civilization all occurred, that's where records came from. So I, I always like to know the history of where things evolved and, and how it, how it uh, has progressed over the thousands of years. Uh, modern day records management uh, was largely due to Mr. Emma J. Leahy. Uh, he was mm -hmm. a uh, former uh, archivist at the National Archives, and uh, he uh, created really the concept of off-site a record storage and then had a company that he started which was called Pierce Leahy and they're still around. Uh, that was uh, started in 1948. Anyone want to guess uh, why he would have had to go off site or what would have prompted a move like that? Why there would have been so much paper created during that time frame? Anyone? Very good. World War II, the war effort. Uh, a lot of communication, a lot of paper was created and it had to be sorted and filed and, and retrieved very quickly. Best way to do that was uh, through paper, you know, for, for an archival and uh, inactive record standpoint. Okay, next slide. You can go ahead. Thanks. Wow, it's all right. Uh, so why is records management important? Um, I've got uh, about three slides here that we've expanded upon since last time we chatted. Um, this is from uh, information from PRISM International. And uh, there's some stats here about the growth rate of active files, 25% annually. Now, this is mostly around paper. We're going to get to the electronic stuff. Uh, so paper is still continuing to grow. 90% uh, of records once filed are never referred to again. So, you know, when you put it away, you, chances are you're just not going to go back and look at it. 95% of references to records are less than three years old, uh, which is important because, as you learned in this class, indexing is extremely important part of records management. If you file something in a file drawer and you don't put an index on it, you know, good luck finding it. You know, we, we're human beings, we forget. You know, when we start dealing with large quantities of physical information, you've got to have a record of that. Okay? Uh, average cost to create a one page document is about $180. And for you accounting majors, that's including the soft costs. You know, that's the people, the time, you know, the, uh, the hard costs, the space, the, the electricity, the computers, all of the resources it takes to create that document. Mm -hmm. About $180. So uh, it, it's expensive, uh, the multiple versions and such. It, it takes time to, to create that. And regulatory requirements and penalties are drivers for better RIM programs, which again, as I preface, Tom will get into. Next slide, please. Uh, some data on data, if you will. Um, 2011, the amount of information created surpassed 1.8 zettabytes. So for those of you who cannot do the reverse conversion to gigabytes, it's 1.8 trillion gigabytes in that year. Uh, there's another stat that uh, in ARMA, which is the American Records Management Association, had published. And again, uh, don't quote me on this, but I want to say the, was it 2011, the information that was created between 2006 and 2011 was more information that had been created from the history of the world in, from an information standpoint. 
So you think back to you know the Gutenberg press and how much information was out there, it, it just was puny compared to the amount of information that was created in that time span. So we're literally in the midst of an information explosion uh, and, and there's got to be ways to kind of manage that. So we'll talk more about uh, that. 5% uh, of information subject to regulatory obligations, 25% of corporate data has business value, and 2% subject to a legal hold. Uh, how many of you know what a legal hold is? Have you guys covered that? Okay. So let's say uh, there's an organization and you get sued. And the attorney says, all right, uh, we've got litigation and I need you to put a hold on these records, which means they have to be frozen. They can't be touched and they need to be produced for a lawsuit or for, you know, the whatever the litigation would call for. Um, those records can't be modified and uh, really in the past, uh, it was really all hands on deck. You dug up emails, you dug up everything, and that information was used for the discovery process in a legal proceeding. Uh, all of that being said, when you do the math, 68% is that considered waste? Uh, in most cases, it is. So 60% of the information that you have out in the companies that you're going to be working for is going to be considered waste. Not so much that it's just worthless, but it could be copies of records. So when emails go out and it's attachments to, to hundreds of students or thousands of students, that's a, a copy in everyone's inbox. It takes space on a server to store all of that, okay? Uh, the source record, the original copy, is the true record, but the copies, of course, have to be managed somehow. So when you think of quote-unquote waste, you have to discern between what you have to keep and what you don't have to. So you can see a large percentage of not only paper but data out there really doesn't need to be around, all right? Especially the social media side, which that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> uh, we may be here till 4 if we talk about that. <laughs> uh, meeting costs for collection. Uh, $910 per gigabyte for e-discovery. So e-discovery is a concept that really became known right around 2006 when a lot of attorneys started to really understand that, hey, you know, there might be some incriminating emails out there that uh, I want to look at. So I, I need to find those emails. Or, you know, there's a lot of files on the server that I might want to dig through because, you know, that HR sexual harassment case that was going on and, you know, no one could prove in the past that, you know, it was he said, she said. Well, there's emails now from, you know, Chachi, you know, really going after Joni inappropriately at the workplace. Well, opposing counsel is going to want that email, right, to show that, hey, my, my, my client, uh, Joni, was harassed by this Chachi guy, and I need to prove it. Well, e-discovery became huge because now you've got this big repository of information, okay, where they're looking for, you know, 2% of the information or maybe 5% of the information, but they've got to scan 100% of it. And there's a cost to not only collect that, but review it, go through it, and send it to opposing counsel. So that's where that $910 per gigabyte, which is just a median cost. Some of them have gotten up into $350,000 per gigabyte. We'll, we'll talk about that here. Um, the cost per gigabyte, and this is, the, this is the information growth paradox again. You can look up a Best Buy ad, and you can look at USB sticks that you could probably buy in the bookstore here, and you can see that they've gotten much more in capacity and they've dropped in price or stayed just about the same. And the example is you can get about a three terabyte external hard drive for say about $150. Okay, three terabytes is a lot of data. Okay, that's portable that you can just take with you. Okay, from a corporate standpoint, as a records manager at Kent Record Management, that scares the living out of me. Okay, because how can I prevent Chachi from plugging in an external hard drive, copying all of our information, and walking out the door? I mean, that, that's theft, okay, crime has occurred, but it still happened. So how do I prevent that? There's software to be able to prevent that. So, you know, of course, the government's come up with things to, to you know, identity management and security uh, systems that will alert you when those types of devices that are unauthorized are plugged in. But for most companies, I can tell you from in the area here, they don't have that sophisticated software. So you have to have a, a lot of education, uh, a lot of training, and a lot of awareness. But getting back to the cost of uh, per gig, you can see how it's declined. But the total investment to support that information, you know, all the servers, all the data, the people, continues to steadily increase. So it's okay. Uh, so really what you can see here is that as the storage, as it becomes cheaper, it's really starting to commoditize the more data that we have out there. You know, and as a result, we really have truly an epidemic on our hands. You've heard about the national obesity epidemic. Really the same thing is going on with information. There's just too much information out there. And, and frankly, it's really slowing down all kinds of things. Government, business, you know, it's all being affected because there's just too much information out there. 
uh, to really manage. Next slide. So how do we address some of these issues? Uh, records management is a, is a domain, is a function and a job that really uh, helps one uh, or an organization address these concerns and challenges. Uh, historically, records managers have not had a seat at the table. You know, again, you think of what are those, you know, fancy positions out there. I, I won't name the university, but, you know, they say, you know, take our MBA course and, you know, be, make your first executive decision. Well, everyone wants to be a CEO. You know, everyone wants to be a CFO. We've all heard of COOs or marketing officers or VPs of whatever. No one's ever heard of, you know, chief records manager, chief records officer, you know. And that's... You know, again, you don't have little kids growing up saying, I want to be a records manager. I want to study library sciences, you know. I mean, we hear jokes about libraries, right? I mean, it's, it's not something that we in the industry deem sexy, okay? And it's really not, but it is extremely important. Uh, and information is an asset that all organizations need to embrace. And if they ignore it, you, there can be dire consequences associated with it. So the day in the life of a records manager. Uh, we plan and organize new record programs or record systems. So this can mean record systems for physical media. It can mean record systems for electronic. Uh, it could be record systems based on, you know, geography. You've talked about the different classification schemes, I would imagine. Uh, it, it's, it's something that we really are doing every single day. There's always a repository or a group or a, um, cluster of information that needs our help to be organized, okay? I would do an exercise in the class, but we don't have time, but if I gave everyone a listing of alphabetical files, okay, and said, I want you to organize this in a way that you would be able to retrieve it, I would say 100% of you would not come up with the exact same system to do it. Now, you may think to yourself, well, Mr. Isasi, alphabet, alpha K, you know, everyone knows how to, you know, put things in order, A through Z, right? Well, who did it by first name? Who did it by last name? Maybe there was more information. Someone said, hey, you know, I want to have an extra index field in here because in case this gets screwed up, maybe I want to do it by date as well. And everyone types out, you know, their index scheme and it's going to be very different. Well, that's, again, an issue records managers have, especially in organizations where there's no um, compliance or policy associated with that because then everyone has their own filing system. You know, that's actually corporate property or that's government property and, you know, it's up to them to really enforce those types of indexing schemes. But oftentimes we get busy, we have jobs, you know, we, we, we get tied up with life and no one has time for that. We can find our stuff. I don't care if Tom can't find my stuff, it doesn't matter to me. Well, looking for things costs money, right? When you lose it, it's an issue. And uh, that's something that we try to prevent every day or make it easier for employees and, and folks who need the information to achieve. Uh, establish retention schedules. Um, you've talked about that, I would imagine? Will be, okay. Uh, not to ruin it, but, uh, and, and burst the bubble on retention schedules, but really, um, SOL means something totally different in my world than it does to you, okay? <laughs> Statute of limitations, okay? Uh, how long something needs to be kept and why and what's telling you to, to keep it for that long. And so when you have HR files and you have uh, files that are, you know, financial tax information, how long do you truly have to keep it? Well, you have to look up the, uh, uh, the codes to what these regulations are. And there are state codes, there's, there's federal codes, there's different associations or department codes that you need to find uh, within the federal government. Uh, there could be some local ordinances you have to follow, and you as a records manager working with legal counsel have to determine what the statute of limitations is going to be that you're going to follow, because one may say three, one may say six, and one may say seven for the same information. So how do you know which one to pick? Well, it's based on risk within the organization and your ability to manage it. All right. Most attorneys are going to say, well, let's go out the farthest we can. Others are going to say, you know what, as soon as we can legally get rid of that stuff, get rid of it. You know, maybe you're um, in a highly litigious environment. Usually pharmaceutical companies are, are litigated against constantly. You know, anytime you create a product that someone puts into their body, you are subject for litigation. You know, I took a pill and I turned purple. Well, I'm suing someone because now my, my face is ruined for life. You know, well, there you go. Or I made an energy drink and, you know, people's fingernails grew at a rapid rate and this is unacceptable. You know, people are going to get sued. Well. You might want to start destroying some of your records as quick as you can because if you have a retention schedule and you follow it and you destroy against that or, or manage records against that, those records are no longer subject to discovery and legal proceedings. So there's a huge value and a huge benefit <clears throat> for companies to follow a retention schedule that's lawful and legal. Okay? An attorney needs to sign off on it. So you can't just arbitrarily say, well, 
Law says I can keep it for five, but I'm going to keep it for four. Just, you know, I'm going to kind of bend it a little bit. Eh, you know, that's probably not a good idea, unless, of course, your corporate counsel said that's okay to do. Because they're the ones who have to stand up in front of a judge and opposing counsel, and they defend you, okay? If they're, of course, reputable attorney, because you're paying them, et cetera, et cetera, not just doing it for the money. Uh, educate personnel and other departments about records management programs. So like what we're doing today, you know, if you're a records manager, you're going to be going around to different departments and just, you know, evangelizing and preaching the gospel. Hopefully you've got a policy. Hopefully you've got a retention schedule you can talk against. But maybe you don't. Maybe you're building your case, you know, and, and you've got to really build that case and do interviews and find out, okay, you know, these three gals are indexing by numbers and these two folks are indexing by you know, geography and these four are indexing by, you know, last name, alphabetical, and no one can find anything. Well, of course they can't. You know, so now we need as records managers to get together and, and start training and, uh, on what the uh, organization requires. Of course, there's federal and state legal requirements for records retention I talked about. Conduct record inventories and appraisals. This is key, okay? So let's say you get to that day where, you know, everyone says, you know, I get it. You, you, you have control. Here's the keys. Take over records. Do whatever you got to do, okay? First thing you got to do is an inventory. You got to figure out what you got, Okay. So you're going to look on these things, not the monitor, but the computer attached to the monitor, the servers, file cabinets, you know, people's uh, iPads, you know, mobile devices. What, where does our corporate information live? Okay? And then you have to perform an appraisal. Now, you've all seen the, uh, I don't know what they call it, the road shows. Antique where you, road show. Antique road show where you bring in your old stuff and, you know, someone who apparently that's all they do, they tell you how much it's worth. Okay, that's what you have to do with the information. So um, I would make a guess that your birth certificate is a little more valuable to, to you than a uh, graded paper from your professor, right? So you might protect your birth certificate and put that in a place that's a little more safe and secure than you would, you know, your, your old papers from school, okay? Same thing in the business world. We, we actually classify some of those records that are very, very important as vital records. They're vital to the functioning uh, operation of the organization. Without these records, and if we lose them or our business goes, you know, gets into peril, we may not be able to recover from it. You know, we're talking about insurance information, uh, bylaws, you know, articles of incorporation, uh, disaster recovery, you know, procedures, those types of things, those are deemed vital records that we want to protect. So we talked about the vault with Kent Records. We've got clients who store boxes of paper and electronic information that are deemed vital in our vault. Um, it's a higher rent space, but you know, it's four hour rated block wall. We've got all kinds of fire suppression systems in there. There's all kinds of, uh, there's flood detection in that room. Um, we use it for a tornado shelter. You know, it's, it's, it's steel reinforced concrete all the way around. So it's a true vault. Um, outside of that vault in the normal record center, you know, is the non-vital records for our clients. Or maybe they're vital and the customers haven't deemed them vital yet. So that's what we try to preach to our customers as well. Um, enforcing and managing legal hold orders. So again, when an attorney says, hey, we've got litigation, or according to the Federal Rules of Procedure, 2006, it was pending litigation. Okay, so you don't even have to be sued. It could be the thought that you might be sued, which is kind of gray, right? So does anyone want to think of any examples of when they might be sued? Be creative. Remember, we are being recorded. Yeah. Yeah, I got a little Boston Terrier. His name's Bubsies. You know, and he loses his mind and goes after the neighbor and bites him in the ankle. You know, he's on the ground bleeding. His, you know, tendon is, you know, can't get up, you know, being recorded. Uh, you know, I'm probably going to be sued, right? So I, if I'm a company, I'm going to want to put a legal hold on maybe the photos or maybe my happenings from that morning and any emails they sent to show that I, you know, was not paying attention to my dog or what have you. Or maybe the lock on my door that he use his paw to open. I don't know. You know, I need to keep track of that kind of stuff because guess what? His attorney's going to want to know, hey, where are the, where's the failures there? You know, what, what happened? Okay, so you're a car manufacturer, you have a new car that goes out, you want to keep record of all the defects or the 
issues that that car has been involved with so you can you know comply with maybe some recall stipulations or uh, show that you've addressed issues in the event someone sues you saying you've done nothing, you can show that you've, you've done that, right? Is that what you're saying? Okay, yep, that's a good example. Um, does anyone not understand that concept? Okay, good. Uh, overseeing the uh, record destruction program, uh, this is also important. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Enron, Arthur Anderson uh, issue, okay. Uh, where Enron was doing some bad things, and uh, they had their uh, accounting firm, uh, Arthur Anderson, have shredding parties for them, basically called and said, just get rid of all this stuff. It's incriminating. We don't, we don't want it around. It's going to make us look bad. We are going to lose lots of money in court or maybe even go to jail. Well, they pretty much violated, uh, you know, the, the uh, discovery rules that are out there. When, when you destroy a bunch of information after it's supposed to be held, uh, basically, that's called spoliation of ed evidence. It means you've tampered with evidence. And at that point, two things can happen. There could be a, a default judgment. Basically, the judge says, you know, uh, you screwed up. They, they can't defend their case or you can't, they can't prosecute you anymore. So basically, I'm going to award them the, them the win because you messed with the, the files. Um, or it could go to a, a lesser situation where they say, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that didn't really go right here, and uh, you know we need to really you know put this out further uh, for review. Oh, and by the way, you're going to pay for all of that. You know you're going to pay for opposing counsel, and it's going to cost you a lot of money. So either way, it's probably not going to end up well. Um, and as a records manager, I can tell you that there's times where you have to put a hold on things that you know probably will incriminate you, but by destroying it, you're actually doing more harm than good. A lot of times, judges or folks will give companies. Uh, uh, a pass or give them the benefit of the doubt saying, look, you did everything you could. Um, you know, obviously I could slap you with X fine, but I'm going to slap you with a fall smaller fine because you did everything you could to um, help Chachi out, you know, from you know, uh, harassing Joni. You know, you sent him to, you know, uh, anger management. You sent him to, you know, uh, coworker training. You sent him to all this trying training. You did everything you could. You have a record of that, but he still did it. So, you know, it's your responsibility because it happened on your watch, but you know what? It's not going to be as bad, all right? Well, if we would have destroyed all those emails, you know, it, automatically it's, you know, it's too bad. So by having a good destruction program, you want to make sure, one, you're not destroying things that are on hold. That's important. And two, you're not destroying things that are really outside of the retention or that are part of a retention schedule prematurely, all right? Secondly, you want to make sure you're not hanging on to anything too long. If you have a retention schedule and you're not following it, that could pose issues as well, okay? Uh, there's the other part too where if it's not on the retention schedule that doesn't mean anything that's you know not is okay for destruction whenever it could be a new record or something that you have to bring the attention of the records manager and some you know stipulations maybe have to be put on top of that so when in doubt I like to tell people look if you've got if you have a copy of something go ahead and you can destroy it if you know for sure 100% sure it's not the source record like an email attachment get rid of it you don't you don't need to but if it's if you're not sure if it's a source attachment or not you better keep it and you better raise your hand and say, what do I do with this when, when you all have jobs in the, or if you have jobs now in the real world. Um, selling new records programs to senior management. Um, fortunately, being in senior management at Ken Records, I don't have to sell myself a records program. You know, I, I was able to create it and, and they, they knew exactly what I was doing with it. Uh, but for the folks that uh, work at companies where records management is something they've been tasked with and you know, they can't get new file cabinets and they can't get new you know, folder labels, let alone pitching for a new electronic document management system or a records management application, they've really got their work cut out for them. So they've got to constantly sell the concept of we've got too much information, the cost of data is you know, going up, uh, the risks are continuing to increase, et cetera, et cetera. And Tom's going to talk about the financial impact of not complying with some of these regulations. And it's big money, too. Uh, here's an example of a record inventory form that uh, ARMA issues. Um, you can see at the upper left-hand corner, Department name, inventory person name, who's doing it, the record title, the record description. Have you folks seen some, something like this? Okay. Um, so imagine yourself, uh, you are, uh, say, Jane and John Doe. You know, you are records uh, analysts, and your job is to go to a new site and do a records inventory. You would have a form, something like this, or maybe something electronically on your laptop or, you know, iPad or mobile device that you would uh, enter the information in, and you would make a collection of, of what you have, and you kind of tag it. So then you can put the proper uh, appraisal on it and, and, and work with it on the back end and maybe apply it to your retention schedule or create a new record series item, okay? So that's just an example of a form, something that I wanted to bring in from the outside to show you folks uh, 
what happens. Um, here's a, an example of a retention schedule. So you can see on the left-hand side, you've got more of a record series number. So if someone says uh, item number 34.001, they're talking about annual reports. There's a definition of what an annual report is, and then there's a total retention, which is PERM. According to legend, mm -hmm. the bottom means permanent. Anyone want to take a guess of how long you need to keep it if it's permanent? Forever. Plus one day. Plus an, forever. Okay. So when you're putting together a record retention schedule for your future record managers, when you put something down as perm, permanent, it means permanent. Thousand years. That's not permanent. That's too soon. Okay. Ten thousand years. Yeah. I mean, so you have to think about really, do we have to keep this for ten, twelve, a million years? Really? Okay, so that's where you start to back off and say, all right, maybe 50 years. You know, maybe, is there going to be any value 100 years from now? Okay, there's another term that uh, our corporate counsel and I went back and forth on. <laughs> uh, it was a very spirited conversation. Uh, we were talking about permanent and, you know, being very careful we deem permanent, but he said, well, why don't we use the term indefinite? You know, there's a little flexibility. You can kind of do what you want with the term indefinite. You know, you can keep it forever. Or, you know, you might be able to just say, well, in three years, I want to get rid of it. Well, from a records management standpoint, that's a problem, okay? Well, I don't want to keep things indefinitely. I want to be able to get rid of it or keep it forever and manage it appropriately. Indefinite is too, it's too vague. Well, of course, at the end of the day, he's our attorney, and he has to defend us, and he has to be able to, <laughs> you know, hold up with that. And, you know, the more I argued with him, the more, you know, I was getting billed. So I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to let this one go, so. <laughs> Uh, and it was only for a couple records. Um, so other designations here, you've got SUP. That stands for uh, superseded, which means that it superseded a previous policy. Uh, CR plus six, which means creation date plus six years. Okay, And this is just one example of how to do this. There's simpler ways to do it, uh, but this is a little bit more advanced. Uh, active, as soon as it becomes uh, active, uh, you, you just need to keep it. Uh, it's not as... Uh, you know, specific. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways to classify the retention periods of things. So it meets the demands of business and legal obligations, okay? Which is kind of the basis of the record of a definition. So um, now comes a day where, you know, you've been a records clerk or a mail clerk or a records analyst and you want to become certified. You want to become a, a records manager. You want to be someone who does this for an organization. What are the things you need to do? Well, um, to get the CRM designation, Certified Records Manager designation, you have to have a combination of education, professional work experience, and you have to pass six-part exams. How many people have actually taken an exam through like a Cometric site? Anybody? Anyone in IT? Where you go into a... Okay. Yeah, it's very similar. Literally, you walk in and, you know, for guys, uh, you know, I don't know what they do for gals. I, I have never proctored one of these. But for guys, literally, it's you know, empty your pockets. You walk in with just your, your, your ID. There's no watch. You know, glasses, if you, if you can't see, you need your glasses. But a lot of times, it may not even be a belt, depending on how you know, stringent they are. You literally go in. They have a camera on. You sit in front of a, a computer that's timed. You take an exam. And then you pretty much find out, for the most part, whether you passed or failed. So you've got to do that five times for the certified records designation on 100 point questions on various topics. So the first one's management principles and record and the records information um, program. So that's really a combination of how many folks have actually taken a management class? Okay, so you guys heard about Herzberg or McClellan, uh, McClellan's theory of X and Y. That sound familiar? Okay, you're going to be tested on just the basic management principles. Okay, uh, then uh, part two is records information creation and use, and it's not just paper and data. This is old school stuff, microfilm, microfiche, you guys know what that stuff is? Okay, yeah, that stuff is still being created and still needs to be managed and governed just like anything else. Uh, backup tape, so you really learn about that. Uh, how to index something, how to classify it, what taxonomies you have, like file systems, okay? You know, you've heard of the Dewey Decimal System? You can come up with your own system at work that people hopefully should follow, okay? Uh, record system, part three, record system storage or retrieval. So. What applications are used to manage records? Physical, electronic, uh, how are they stored and how are they retrieved? Four is the appraisal, retention, protection, and disposition. Disposition isn't destruction, it's really when it hits that phase of retention where it's met, say so creation plus six years, disposition occurs, which is the next step of maybe something needs to be destroyed, maybe it needs to go into an archive, maybe it needs to be reviewed, 
Uh, there's a number of different things that can fall under disposition. So just because the retention period's been hit doesn't mean that you automatically throw it out. All right. Number five, part five is technology. This is the toughest one for people to follow because most records managers don't have a strong technology background. How many people know what a SAN is? Except for Tom. <laughs> Storage area network. Okay. It's basically a, okay, I almost did it. I almost used an acronym and I didn't explain what it was. Call myself. I'm getting better at that. <laughs> um, it's essentially a redundant array of independent disks, which are hard drives. Uh, so you figure, uh, you've seen the computer towers, right, before uh, big cases where computers and the blinky lights. And you put in this uh, SAN, and it literally has maybe 16, maybe upwards to 24 hard drives in it that are in a RAID array. So they're all linked together, and that's where data is stored, okay? You have to know things like that because you might be doing an inventory on something like that, physically and electronically. Okay, did I lose everybody with that? Is it, is it, okay. Uh, virtual machines, virtual servers, does, does anyone know what those are? Go ahead. Isn't a virtual server like an email? Can be, yep, can be. Uh, so a physical server is something that's physical, like a computer tower or a rack mount computer server that you put into a computer rack. Um, you know, there's a hard drive and it has its own function, maybe it's an email server, maybe it's a web server, maybe it's used to store files. Well, back in the day, you bought more physical servers and you bought these big data centers because you needed more space and more, more processing power. Well, as the concept of virtual technology took on, you were able to take a big physical server and put virtual or ghost servers on it that didn't know they were physical, okay? So it's basically big software files that function as real servers. And you can move them around to different servers. You could clone them very quickly. <coughs> Back in the day where you had to build up a new server and it could take days or weeks, now you could clone a server in minutes, okay? So IT people now, instead of managing these big data centers with all this equipment and all this power that's being used, there was an IBM commercial that came out where all the executives were on the table and all these little cartoon creatures came around and all these little trees were popping up because it had a big green initiative. Well, imagine if you're able to do more with less. Have all the same computing power in virtual servers, but only use two computer racks versus 25. You know, that's a lot less consumption of energy. Well, it presents a problem for records manager because if you can clone servers with that information that quick, well, you've, you've got a duplicate. Where'd that go? Who's managing it? Who's governing it? It's out there. How do you know? Who, who's keeping track of that? Okay? It could be a clone of your entire records keeping system. <coughs> and it just stays in state. Well, if you forget about it, that's kind of a big risk, right? Just to have that hanging out there somewhere. So that's what the technology part talks about. And then part six was, um, whew, that was a big one for me. Uh, it's a four hour exam. There's two case studies. You have to read them, uh, come up with findings and write a report on what you would do in certain scenarios in the same type of setting. So after I was done teaching at Davenport last April, I uh, drove down to Fort Wayne, Indiana, because there's only certain testing sites you can take this. Got into Fort Wayne about midnight, uh, woke up, and had to be at the testing center by 7 a.m. I sat in that chair for uh, all of four hours. I didn't move. I thought for sure I'm going to have to take a bathroom break. You know, I'm going to get up and, you know, a chiropractor would probably you know, have to crack my neck. You know, something had to happen, you know, for me to. I sat there for four straight hours and did nothing but read and type, you know. And I hit submit and walked out and had no idea if I passed because it goes to a committee and they review all your answers. And if you pass then, after six weeks of review, then they award you the certified records manager. But you can't take part six until you pass all five parts. Okay. Now I'm on the uh, exam development committee, which is another cool thing. Once you become a CRM and if people like you, which as of this morning I'm still liked, I think. Um, uh, I travel to... A uh, couple places uh, throughout the year, and I sit down. We basically sit in a room and create test questions and evaluate test questions, you know, with the other CRMs. So it's a lot of fun. It's a very humbling experience. Um, one of the uh, individuals uh, on the committee uh, heads up uh, NARO, the National Association of uh, Records, uh, and I can't, National American Records Association. Yeah, I think it is. Basically, the federal government's version of you know how to manage records from the government level. Uh, Mike Miller was in the room, and he'd been in records for 30 years. Works in Washington D.C. You know, I'm, I'm little Andrew in Grand Rapids. You know, I, who am I? You know, you heard me joking. I think I'm a pretty big deal. Not in that room. I'll tell you what. Uh, but I learn a lot. So it's, it's great, uh, good peer review. And, and they're, they're really committed to the craft. So when you sit down and take those exams, they're, they're prudent. 
it's not going to be 50 questions on microfilm like it was back in 1985. You know, it's going to be more real, and that, that's, that's the purpose of it. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so requirements to become a certified records manager. Uh, you almost had it. Uh, you have to have a four years uh, bachelor degree uh, plus one year of professional room experience. Now, if you don't have a bachelor's degree, that's okay. You can substitute one year of professional experience uh, for each year of college education. Uh, but you're going to have to have five in total. Uh, back before they changed this rule, if you didn't have a bachelor's degree or if you didn't have an associate's degree, they wanted 11 years of experience. Well, you know, you guys know the challenge. If you don't have experience, you can't get a job, right? Well, now you have to have 11 years of experience, and then you get to sit down and take all these tests. You know, you, you pretty much eliminate so many people from being able to do this. So they're making it easier for folks to obtain uh, the credential. And, and it, it is a management certification, so they want to make sure that you have some experience and some education behind you. You know, management in the corporate world is a little bit different than, um, you know, managing maybe retail or managing uh, restaurants. It's just a different world, especially when you're dealing with records. Um, professional experience, uh, what, what is considered that, conducting studies and surveys, developing, designing, implementing record keeping systems, having direct managerial operational responsibility for a program, or teaching courses on RIM or accredited institutions of higher education on a full-time basis. So those are ways you can gain professional experience to become a certified records manager. You don't need to have all of those, but when you're counting up that, those years, they have to be associated with that. So they're very picky about what it is. And then the timeline uh, is you have to apply and become a candidate. So you have to tell them, I think I want to do this and this is why. And then they basically go through an audit period which they want to make sure that you're going to be able to qualify for these things. And then once you become a full-on candidate, then you can take the exams. And you have a five-year period to complete all six exams. Sounds like a very long time, but factor in work, play, family, you know, everything else. I mean, these exams aren't very easy. Otherwise, everyone would be doing it, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to plan accordingly. I've known folks who've literally gone up to the last testing cycle on that, you know, close to that fifth year. And uh, they were sweating bullets because they didn't know if they were going to pass part six. And if they didn't, they'd have to basically go into a, a re you know, become a candidate again and basically pitch their case that, you know, I can do this in another five years. Five years is a long time. Man, that's a long time, you know. Uh, other folks, they sit down and they take all five parts in one week, you know, when it, the testing cycle happens. Now, you can't take part six in that same week, but you can take part six maybe the second week. So there's folks who've sat down and literally gotten this done in a month after they became a candidate. So you don't have to take five years, but they give you five years to take. Uh, and then, you know, once passing starts, uh, you have to have 100 continuing education credits for five years. So, you know, it doesn't stop there. You don't have to take any more tests, but you've got to come to classes like this, you know, on your own accord, pay your own money, and continue to get education to keep that credential going because, you know, once you have a piece of paper, you know, you can't just say, okay, that's what I'm going to do and just continue to go on and do it. You know, you've got to continue to to be on top of it, especially in records management because the, again, the information, the technology side of it is, is blowing up right now. And if you get lost, it, it, you're, you're, you're not going to have any value to your organization once those new challenges come up, right? All right, next slide. So um, to find out more about uh, records management or becoming a certified records manager, you can go to the Institute of Certified Records Manager website. Uh, they do have job postings there. Um, you know, I, I commonly get asked, well, how many, you know, how much money do I make as a records manager? Because money is important to you guys, right? You know, salary is important. You don't want to know why. If I'm going to go through all this, how much am I going to make? Well, there's job postings out there right now on their website. I want to say they start at 100000 a year. Um, I want to say the average salary for a certified records manager was, I think, high 80s. So it's, it's real dollars. You know, I know a couple folks that uh, when I saw the maximum side, mm -hmm. they were up into the 130s and 140s. You know, when you're in the bigger companies and you're responsible for all of it and you have people, I mean, so it, it's, it can definitely be a very rewarding uh, career, but it can also pay very well, too. So if you had this misnomer that you had to be a CFO or CEO to make, you know, over $100,000 a year, there's plenty of jobs out there where you don't have to do that, but you still have a ton of responsibility. Don't get me wrong. They're not easy jobs, which is why you pay the right people to do them, but <coughs> the money's real. If you want to... Uh, learn more locally uh, or get some more user information on records management, uh, you can go to uh, the ARMA website, www.arma.org, which is the uh, American Record Management Association is what it stands for. There's a local chapter here. I'm on the board. I'm the vice president of program, so I'm responsible for finding people to present. And no, it's, I don't speak every time at the meetings. I find other people to do it. Um, 
Yes, I've, yep. Um, we meet uh, at usually Amway or Kent Records or Davenport. Those are kind of the you know, locations that are spread across town to accommodate everyone. And uh, we meet the third, or the, excuse me, the first Thursday of the month outside of the summer months. Uh, last December, we had a mixer up in Cygnus because we have a lot of folks from Amway who are in our chapter, and the Cygnus mixer was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun up there. Uh, some of you may not be of age, and my apologies for that. <laughs> um, but uh, when you are, you know, in the corporate <laughs> world, it, it's a great place to go up and uh, uh, just mingle with other records managers and share stories. Uh, and then, uh, again, the local ARMA chapter uh, is westmiarma.org, and you can get a listing of our uh, events there. So if you decide to become practitioners or decide to get into the records world, there's a lot of local resources here in Grand Rapids. There's a mid-Michigan chapter, which has a ton of CRMs in it, and the Detroit chapter is pretty big, too. So, um, you know, if, if, if you take anything away from my portion of the presentation, hopefully it's just, a, a, again, a renewed energy of, of what records management is and how important we are to businesses today. Any questions for me before we switch over to Mr. Tom? Okay. Yeah, I put your face right there. So, yeah. So the question was, uh, how are you uh, supposed to destroy information? Is it government mandated, or is there some other type of way to? destroy information, correct? Okay, uh, most of the time, uh, the government, especially if it's government, uh, whether it's federal, state, or local records, there's requirements uh, on the different types of records of how they're destroyed, even how they're duplicated, but because the question was destroyed, we'll stick on that. Uh, in some cases, there's certain size of, of piece of paper that the shredded information can't be any larger than. And that's for vital records. You have to stick within that, that space. Um, there's another concept of cross-cut shredding, where it, it cuts it into tiny pieces. Uh, there's even a pulverization method, uh, which is almost kind of turns it into a powderish, where it's very difficult. Because believe me, there are software tools out there, and, uh, uh, we'll, say, we'll just say tools, that allow you to take ripped pieces of paper, put them into a, 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 a pile, and basically have someone sort them out, and the software will rearrange them and put them in order so you can read the information on it, okay? If I may restate that, criminal software is out there. <laughs> you can buy what's called white hat tools, which is non-criminal software to help do that, <laughs> but it's usually the good guys who have that. Uh, you as an individual likely can. It's more of a law enforcement thing, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, there's uh, other uh, uh, concept of chemical. You can treat the, the paper with chemical, essentially kind of chemical burn, so you eliminate the uh, ink. Maceration which is uh, really making the, the paper wet. So, you know, semi-awkward toilet paper, you put it in toilet water, it kind of disappears, you know, dissipates. Same concept with the record when you, you know, treat it with water and, you know, you kind of turn it into a mulch. And it just, there's not much you can read off of that. Uh, and there's incineration, of course, is another option. Um, so there's a number of different ways uh, to, to do it. It's just important to look at the statute especially if it's federal government records or if it's protected by a regulation, you want to make sure you read those specific regulations to find out what exactly is recommended. Uh, there is no one way to do it, but it's the way that whatever is governed is the way you should really follow it. Um, some folks like to say, you know, I'm going to cross-cut shred everything and pay a little more for it so I know I'm covered, and they do it and they pay it, and then it's, it's okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. Hypothetically speaking, say you were doing Enron records for y'all, Y'all get corporation records, right? And then y'all get it. All right. Mm -hmm. Just think this way. Y'all got their records and everything. It's after a, you know, before everything happened, or after everything happened. Mm -hmm. Y'all follow the Sarbanes Oxley Act thing. Would y'all be responsible for that or go back on Enron? Okay, so the question is would we have responsibilities as an off site storage company uh, for any issues that an organization had with lack of compliance? Well, I'll take it from a couple different angles here. Um, if, if the crime has already been committed and we have records for that organization, uh, one would argue that we would have a legal hold placed on the records we had to make sure that we didn't destroy based on an order from someone else in Enron who might be corrupt or crooked, if you will, to destroy records that we had. Um, and at that point, unless we were told otherwise, 
If we kept them on hold, we'd be okay. But if we decided to destroy anyway, that would be a problem. Um, if we were, if we were, if we knew that a hold happened again, and and we were, we ignored a hold order and just did it anyway because we wanted the money for the shredded paper. That's an issue. Right. So yeah, there is some liability for misconduct on our part. Um, but I don't want to steal Tom Sunder with the HIPAA side because you said, talked about Graham Leach Bliley and Sarbanes Oxley. Uh, HIPAA uh, is a big part of our world right now, which he'll get into on what happens when you mishandle PHI or personally identify. Or, uh, I'll leave that to you. Uh, I was going to say PI, personally identifiable information, but again, I don't want to take into Tom's uh, subject. But if, if we mishandle that, uh, we would be liable automatically, and we have to report that to the Department of Health and Human Services, and there's fines and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. How, how many business records are we responsible for? Uh, businesses? Uh, post acquisition, uh, I would say anywhere between 2,000 and 2,500 in the state of Michigan. And uh, we've got about a million cubic feet of records, which reverse math, you're about 850,000 boxes. When a company gives you their records and you go to present them to your site, and then they ask for them back, do you have your own filing system on that work? Because I know each company has their own specific like, mm -hmm. way they file them. Do you guys use their numbers or do you have your own? Okay, so when boxes come into Kent Record Management, what filing system do we use to track those boxes? Uh, we do have several systems in place. Uh, primarily, we have what's called a, uh, a system called Total Recall, which is a, a barcode and indexing system we use. So every box that comes into our facility has a <coughs> label. Uh, that label has a unique code on it, which is a box number, which is unique to that box. There's a customer number, and there may be even a department number on that box as well. They're all individual barcodes. Those boxes get put into a location, which also has a barcode, okay? down an aisle which has a number system on it. So we're able to find where that box is going to live, assuming that a human doesn't make a mistake and you know, take, a, take a label and put it in the wrong spot. Uh, so you, it's tough to see here, but you can see these little white stickers along the orange. It's going to be very difficult to see. But uh, that's where <coughs> the location codes live. <coughs> now, that tells us where the box is at, who it belongs to, but it doesn't necessarily tell us what's in it. That's up to the customer, and there's a couple different ways they can do that. Uh, they can fill out an Excel spreadsheet. We can upload it into our system. So they log on to our online web portal. They can search, keyword search, uh, and find out where, if that information's at our site and then what the box number would be, and then request retrieval, and our folks would go pick it up. Okay? Uh, the other way is they can go on to the online web system, not use an Excel spreadsheet where we do an upload, which usually Excel is used when there's a large upload or a large pickup. If it's just adding one or two boxes and you have maybe 25 files between the two boxes, uh, you can hand type all the index information that you want within the system. You can have your labels at your site, put the labels on the box, and they go off to Kent Records, and you can you know, search on that information as soon as it hits our system. Uh, we do a similar system with tapes and media. Uh, but it's just it's a little different because media is a little little different animal. There's a little more rotation, a little more activity to media uh, with scheduling and reoccurrence and there are just box storage. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to follow up, you said there were um, five different rules when you uh, heard of the, the wrongdoing or the people uh, just going at it. So for instance for the Graham Records thing, did you have you have just one building where it's Okay, um, so the question is, uh, we service, Ken Records service multiple locations, and uh, if we have more than one site in one city, how do we know what's where? Correct? Is that, all right. Um, frankly, it's through software. Uh, we have uh, different modules in our software called uh, FBUs, or functional business units, and uh, our facility business units, I believe, one of the two. And that identifies the site of which those records are at. So when she does a keyword search for the indexes of her boxes, when a work order is produced on our side, it will automatically show up the site and the location of where that record's at. So we have st uh, staffing at all of our locations who would go pull that record out uh, during normal business hours. How many sites then do you have that are in Grand We have a uh, total of one site here in Grand Rapids. Okay. Yep, one site on Waldorf houses all the records there, and then we've got records distributed. We have sites in each of Lansing, <coughs> Kalamazoo, Benton Harbor, Muskegon. They all have their own sites to service those communities. Uh, but if we do all scan and demand services for northern 
customer in northern Michigan or the Upper Peninsula, those records come to Grand Rapids because our imaging bureau is just much larger. We're able to, con we have scanners there uh, that can scan up to 600 pages a minute. So we, we don't have enough people to, to prep fast enough to keep that thing fed. So does that answer your question? Good question. So when records and boxes come into our facility, the question was, uh, do we sort it by geogra geography or do we keep them together and, and file them away? Is that correct? Yeah. All right. Uh, the answer to that is we do neither. Uh, we are in a, a just in just out system. So uh, as soon as space opens up in certain areas, we fill that space with records. So yes, boxes are intermixed within the entire facility. And that's done for two reasons. One, security. If uh, one of our former employees went rogue or any of our clients realized where their records could be and they left that company, they could potentially break in and go to exactly where all their company's records would be stored. So that's one reason. The second reason is we rely heavily on the software and the barcoding. Uh, for us to be able to section off <coughs> racking that's expensive for one customer, uh, if they're not paying for it, we're just holding it for them. That's a very valuable space. And we are in the space business. so. Our, our objective is to compact and store as much as we can safely in a spot. So by having that just in, just out system, we can file through barcode and we know what box was literally at one location uh, at, at one time. So it's kind of like old school Foursquare, you know? We, we can just look at the history and find out where that box and how it traveled through our system. Does that make sense? Sometimes, uh, if we have to do moves or if we have larger boxes. Uh, I don't know how many people have actually lifted legal banker boxes. Okay. Yeah, they're about, you know, 80 pounds. You know, they're, they're pretty heavy. You know, 50 pounds if they're maybe, you know, half full. Uh, it can be tough on people's backs. Okay, that's 80-pound boxes are tough. Well, if they're stored on the top racks, those are difficult to maneuver. So sometimes we have what's called a, uh, you know, a resort or re-index or a reorg, and we take those boxes and we put them down to the bottom. So if we ever have retrievals, uh, it's a little easier to get to. Make sense? Okay. Question? Okay, the question was, are businesses charged for each record or the amount of storage that's used? Um, the answer is all of the above. Uh, it depends on the need of the business. Uh, some of our clients choose to be charged by the box. Uh, others like to be charged by the cubic foot. Uh, so that depends. Um, data is by the gigabyte, usually. Um, tapes are by the slot, you know, uh, or maybe the shelf. On rare occasions, we rent out a shelf. But for the most part, we like to keep it by location. If you want to rent a spot there, like a big safe deposit box, that's what you rent. Cool. Um, so say if a third party goes through something and sort of mirrors some data from a different thing and maybe steals one from the slot or takes the shelf, what do you guys then do to make sure the company that bought the data is also the company that bought the data? So there's question marks all through the building, not really that clear. How would that work? OK. So the question is, uh, what, would, what does Ken Records do in the event an employee were to uh, do something on purpose or, or maybe accident? Or ac accidentally? Okay, okay. Uh, take or misuse information. Uh, well, yeah, that's a, that's a big issue for us. Um, so the way we combat that is through a lot of education, a lot of training on uh, why that's a bad idea. Above and beyond, it's just not good business. Uh, you know, accidents do happen. You know, we're people. We make mistakes. It just happens every single day. So we work in management to try to reduce those mistakes uh, as much as possible. Well, when they do occur, and they are truly <coughs> accidents, uh, we have an incident process that we have to follow, and if certain information was breached, uh, if it was PHI or MPI, which Tom will get into, then we're obligated to not only report that to the organization, but we have, may have to report that to the Department of Health and Human Services. Again, there's certain si situations that, you know, that could vary. Um, if the individual knowingly did something, uh, one could argue then that chances are they would probably lose their job. And I say probably just because, again, it, Every, every situation is different, uh, but there could even be some criminal uh, uh, action taken against that individual as well. So, does that answer your question? Okay, good. Okay, so uh, job opportunities, uh, at Ken Records, and, and what's the retention of employees? Yeah, okay. Uh, 
Well, first, it's, it's actually Kent Record, Kent Record Management, and we call ourselves Kent Records. We're not affiliated with local county government. We're a separate entity, so a lot of folks, they either think we're Kent County Records, which isn't <coughs> true, or they think we're literally musicians, like records, you know, storage, which we have plenty of musicians. Tom plays drums. Our president plays drums. We have a singer, you know, but, but that's, that's not what we do. It's just, just a record <laughs> store. Um, I certainly do not do anything with instruments. Uh, yes, uh, there are opportunities uh, available. Uh, right now, I want to say that uh, there's opportunities in our imaging area where we do the file prep. Um, and I can tell you that employees, and Tom can attest to this, uh, he used to work at Kent Records. Uh, employees, when they work with us, they stay for quite a while. Um, we've got employees that have been with us for 25 years. Um, I've been with Kent in June for six years. So um, if, if you're a good employee and you want to work and uh, you like our culture and like our environment, there's really no reason that you would want to move on. And there is upward mobility from a growing standpoint. Uh, we went from 48 employee, excuse me, we went from about 40 employees in 2011 to f almost 50 employees uh, before 2012 and this past acquisition we're now at about 77 employees. By the end of the year we're looking at uh, probably close to 85 uh, because of the growth in imaging and shredding. Yes? Uh, I, did a, I did a study when I was there a couple years ago when I was doing HR for Kent Records um, and it was probably in 2010 the average length of employment for all of our employees all, all factored in was 12 years and at the time I had only been there 10 so it was uh, yeah, it's a it's a pretty stable group of folks. You know, it's it, you know there's not a lot of turnover, um, but there's always turnover for one reason or another. So, uh, you know, people's lives change. You know, get married, move on, or go to school. You know, those types of things. Of course, you know, I'd be remiss to say we, we haven't had an occasional issue with an employee. I mean, it happens, right? <coughs> uh, but those boxes typically stay. You know, so every year we uh, we definitely gain more boxes than we destroy. That's for sure. So it, it's a pretty secure business in that standpoint. Anyone? Okay, uh, boy, that's a good operations question. The question was, <laughs> how many records do we add every day? I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Uh, I can give you a close ballpark. Um, imaging records, uh, boy, it, it really could depend uh, on that. Uh, you could say per, per year, last year we, we added about uh, – uh, I'm not even going to venture a guess. I know it's a lot. It's hundreds of thousands of electronic records. Uh, but I can tell you activity-wise, we're at about 2,000 touches a day uh, for, for either boxes or files uh, throughout our enterprise. And that's last year's numbers. It's probably even higher. I would say it's probably closer to 2,500 a day now. Yep. Uh, there was another. Oh, I'm sorry. He was saying, and I'll come back to you. Go ahead. You all look at Grand Slope. Kent Records look at Grand Slope as a storage spot or an IT department for other organizations. The question was, uh, does Kent Records look at themselves as a storage a repository or are we an IT, outside IT resource? Uh, the answer is, is both, but primar primarily we're outside storage facility. We do have technology services we provide, but it's more of a, a complement to existing IT departments. We don't do managed services where we watch servers for you or have people go out to your site and fix computers. We don't do that. Uh, our motto is your off-site solution. So if you want to have a server and store it at Kent Records, that's fine. We can monitor for you. But if you want us to fix it, it's going to cost you money to do that. But we don't tout ourselves as being break, fix, we're your IT department for you. Does that answer your question? Yes. OK. How do Good question. How do we insure the records in the event there was a fire, flood, or a disaster? Uh, well, uh, we have general errors and emissions and warehouse uh, liability uh, insurance that uh, covers up to a certain dollar amount. So in the event, you know, all five of our locations, you know, were wiped out, you know, in one day, you know, there would be a, a insurance, you know, probably audit and then a payout according to that. And, of course, we'd have to give some of that to our clients because we insure their boxes for a certain value. value. Uh, there's also insurance we have in the event an employee makes a mistake or we have a regulatory fine. We have to have new insurance now, which... Again, getting into Tom's presentation uh, that we had to cover because <coughs> there can be fines that are hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that aren't covered under normal insurance policies. So we had to buy more insurance 
to cover that. And there's always a business risk. You, know, you can buy insurance for everything these days. How much do you truly need? So there's that risk management process we had to go through and find out really you know, how much we're willing to lose. But realistically, though, we don't know the value of that information. That's up to our customers. We just value it per box. So there could be a box of, let's say, uh, uh, a famous person's financials or historical information, or there could be a box of old receipts. We value those boxes each the same. The customers may not. So if they want to value that box higher, they have to let us know and declare excess valuation as the term, or put their own insurance on those boxes in the event they're lost as vital records. Does that answer your question? Cubic foot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, but are they for different prices for um, video tapes or paper? Would this like apply to video tapes or paper films that would pass under the box of video tapes? Okay, so the question is if uh, do we charge the same for a box of paper or a box of, of video tapes? Yeah, but it's like it's different even what I want to get sold. Sure. Uh, the answer to that is, of course, academically, it, it depends. Um, <laughs> if it's. <laughs> If it's the same box we use for paper and, and a client wants to put a bunch of videotapes in that, it's the same, the same price. Uh, but if a client wants to store those videotapes in the data vault or our, our media vault and they want them slotted and indexed individually, there's a different rate for that. Okay. So it just depends on the storage requirement. But from a unit standpoint, whatever we put into the slot in the media or whatever we put in the box, it's the same unit price. Ah, yeah, the, the concept of that is called uh, manus manuscript collection. Uh, yeah, we've, uh, we've got uh, uh, artists who store their drawings with us. Uh, we have family records, uh, like you referenced. Um, we've got uh, important people from big companies in the area who might have their own uh, uh, historical business records that they want kept separate from the business because uh, it's, it's part of their property, so they pay us separately for that, even though we store all of their company records. So we do that as well. Any other questions? Good question. Uh, the question was, how often do we create new record keeping systems, or how frequently do we? Okay. Uh, really, that's dictated by business need. Um, I can confidently say that uh, a normal file structure or file system, once it's set and working, uh, there's not much change that needs to be made to it. It's more maintained. Um, if anything, it's evolved into more of a content management or a document management system where there's a back-end repository of a database and an application where you can keyword search versus drill down through folders, which you probably, mm -hmm. hopefully, all still do unless you're all on Google Docs and don't know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> but if you evolve to a system like that, uh, typically those rollouts, depending on the size of the company, it, it's something that's a matter of years. So, um, you know, I would say some, some, a company of kind of record size, if we converted to a system like that, which we use in some small capacity, but if we did it for everything, would probably be about an 18 month to 24 month process. You know, we, again, you're almost creating a new system. The back end benefit is that you're able to retrieve files quicker, but you gotta get everything in there first. And then you have to train everyone how to use it, they have to adopt it, culture's gotta be right, change management, it's you know, literally asking you to do things differently. Okay? Any other? What is, the st what is the strangest or largest thing that we've had to store at Kent Record Management? Uh, that I know of, uh, we have a, we do tours uh, for uh, other uh, universities and such, and uh, Lansing Community College uh, d does tours in our Lansing facility. And there's a client that stores um, uh, old crime information in one of our aisles. We, we call it uh, death row. <laughs> and it, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's kind of not because it gets a little eerie. But a record doesn't necessarily have to be paper or media. Uh, we have bags uh, that are, are sealed, that are, that are they, they, they pass inspection. 
uh, their, their uh, evidence. Uh, and they could be uh, parts uh, of things. Vacuum now, sealed, right? What's that? They're vacuum sealed. Yeah, they're, they're sealed and they, you know, they, I mean, <clears throat> if you wanted to break them, you'd really have to, to, to get into them. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they're, they're parts of, of uh, organic parts, let's just call it that, that are stored uh, as a result of a crime and they're indexed and they're, they're coded and they, they sit in our record center. So yeah, I, uh, that's about all I can say about that. Well, one of the largest things too that, that I don't even know if it's still there, but um, they have an old stagecoach, oh, yeah. a historical stagecoach, belongs to a family, a local family. And then uh, they, there's a local radio station here that stored a giant boom box, for those of you who are my age that remember what a boom box was, a giant radio. This thing's huge, it's on wheels, it's probably as long as from Andrew to myself. Um, they used to use it for promotional deals for the Children's Miracle Network or something, but... Um, I haven't seen that. No? No, I'd like to it see it. It must be gone. <laughs> no, 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 it was just a big... Now the question was, problem. did it work when it was stored there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the stagecoach I think needs some repair, but it's a full it's on. Old. Yeah, 1800s. Like original, you know, back when they used stagecoaches. Yeah. Kind of neat. Question? Is running out of room a concern? Ah, yes. Is running out of room a concern for Ken Records? <coughs> um, always a concern. Uh, it's called capacity planning. Uh, we do our best with forecasting metrics to determine uh, based, we do our best to try to find out what our client um, uh, activities and actions are going to be. The fact of the matter is, our director of operations will, will never know. You know, if we're going to get 100 boxes in a day or if we get a call for, oh, sorry, we've got 50,000 new boxes coming in the end of the week, you know, which hasn't happened. So typically, record centers, <coughs> uh, best practices operate anywhere between 70 and 80 percent at all times if you can. And if you have a, a threshold of a 90 percent, that's when you need to start planning for the next phase. So um, I'm, that's an operations question. I couldn't tell you, especially after acquisitions, that would be more a director of operations. He could tell you exactly what our capacity would be across the board. In fact, I know he could. He just looked those numbers up uh, late last week. So, because I said, just let me know if we're going to be good or not for the next year. And he said, well, we're good. Okay, that's all I need to know. I don't want to get in the numbers. Have, you guys ever run out of room? have we ever run out of room? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. In our history, we've run out of room. I think at one look, at one point in Grand Rapids, we had four buildings here, uh, and as you know, building would fill up, we would buy another building and start filling it up, and. Uh, that was back in the day where you could, you know, turn around commercial property relatively quickly. Well, as the decline of com commercial property values uh, happened and as more commercial property became available, it just made more sense financially uh, for us to consolidate. Hence why we now have one large facility out on the west side of Grand Rapids, Walker. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, you guys are full of questions. That's great. It is. That's great. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Tom Dumas. I'm going to take over the, uh, the slide duties. Right. And uh, he's going to talk to you about <clears throat> the regulations and the things I referenced. Well, thank you. Um, it's awesome to hear all those questions. Um, Andrew and I went to lunch. We were talking a little bit. Um, we did this presentation, like he said, last semester. Um, so we just went to kind of go hang out and good excuse to have a burger. Um, I really want to commend you folks for, regardless of your age, that you're in college. I just think it's so cool. Um, only one thing kept me out of college, that was high school. Um, I had too much fun, and I had no desire to um, worry about what I was going to do for a living. You know, the world still needs ditch diggers. Um, but I have to tell you, I've known Andrew for all six years he's been associated with Kent Records. I started working at Kent Records in 2000. Uh, my wife is one of the four owners, and, um, geez, somehow I got in there. and. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I started doing all the grunt work, you know. I started at the bottom of the, of the totem pole. Um, they let me just kind of do my thing, and when I mentioned something new, they let me try it. I failed a lot, but they let me try it. Um, I learned by failing. And I just left there in mid-November. Um, I've been doing compliance trainings for the last few years uh, for KRM, and it just got to the point that um, I just really kind of felt that I was led to go do it on my own. And Ken Records has been fantastic, uh, real encouraging, real generous with me, and um, um, very supportive of my effort to kind of go solo. So that's where Prime Compliance came from. Um, our 30-year-old daughter uh, 
uh, she designed the logo and the emphasis is still on RIM, Records and Information Management, because what I do is I travel around and I perform trainings for other record centers and data vaults, scanning and shredding operations. So um, in your pursuit of your education, let me tell you from personal experience by watching this young man, um, you literally can change a business. I watched him do it, okay? There's a four owner system and then there's Andrew as the executive director. When you have any four people in a room together, there's always dysfunction. I don't care who you are, I don't care if you're mother and three daughters or a family of four, it doesn't matter. People have different vision, uh, different value, different opinion, um, and there's often some conflict, okay? And Andrew's been able to bring something new and refreshing um, into an, you know, a pretty established business and, and really, really positively impact it. Um, it's largely because of his personality, okay, and the way he carries himself and can handle himself under stress. Um, him and I don't act the same when we're a little worked up, okay? Um, he's very diplomatic. I'm uh, less diplomatic, okay? And, but, but I've seen it be very, very effective. Um, now, does that mean he brought the latest, greatest things, you, you know, to the table? Um, what he brought to the table was an education, okay? He brought knowledge from classroom and, and these kinds of things and CRM things and all these things he's done. I mean, geez, he's got a master's in what? Administration. What's administration? <laughs> um, so, man, keep on keeping on. I, I think it's great that you guys are, uh, are in pursuit of things regardless of your age. So, um, that's me. Um, certified HIPAA professional, certified security compliance specialist. Um, those letters behind my name don't mean near as much what his letters behind his name mean, but um, it just means I know Not a little true. bit more about these two things than most people, okay? And got lucky enough to pass some exams. So, having said that, um, yeah, let's go. We'll just keep going. We're going to talk about breaches and identity theft, okay? Nowadays, as Andrew alluded to, with, uh, and I do appreciate him taking up that hour and a half, because you guys might not have to do anything else today. Um, <laughs> uh, um, identity theft is huge, okay? It's a huge, huge deal, and you can pretty much open any e-newspaper or regular newspapers. I prefer paper ones to get the ink on your fingers. Um, you can hear about or read about data breaches on a pretty regular basis and you just flip the page and go, really, again, 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 because it happens so frequently. But here's what a breach is according to the government uh, through the HITECH Act. It's unauthorized acquisition, access, use or disclosure of protected health information, or PHI, um, which compromises the security or privacy of such information except where an unauthorized person to whom such information is disclosed would not have reasonably, reasonably have been able to retain such information. What that essentially means, all that, um, what does the term acquire mean? If you acquire something, you receive it, right. You get something, right? Um, so if you get something that you're not supposed to get, how do you typically know it doesn't belong to you? Right? If I got this, and this was a medical record, let's say, how do I know it's not mine? Right? I have to, right? So I kind of have to access it because medical records, quite frankly, all look the same. They're all in manila envelopes, largely, of one sort or another. Use or disclosure. Okay, what do I do with this information? Because I've seen it. Well, I know of a case where someone who worked at a doctor's office mistakenly from a records management company. Um, their names were very similar, these two clients of this record center, okay? We'll say West Michigan Oncology and then the uh, oncologists of West Michigan. And this didn't happen here, okay? One mistakenly went to the other. They opened it up and they were like, wow. Okay? They called the records management company and said, hey, you've uh, delivered the wrong thing here. So the record center People went over and they picked it up at the one place and, and delivered it to the right place. The issue was the lady who looked at that, that was an oncology report for her neighbor's mom, okay? 
so she knew this individual somewhat. So when she went home after work that day, she went out to get her mail, and Mary came out to get her mail, and she said, hey, Mary, hey, Sue, how are you? Good, blah, 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 blah. Oh, Mary, I'm sorry for, oh, I'm just sorry to hear that your mom has cancer. Mary said, my mom has cancer? That's a problem. Okay, that's a problem. All because they used and disclosed something they saw because they mistakenly got something. Okay, so that's where all these laws that, are, that I'm going to talk about, just hip and high tech predominantly, are to better control the use of this kind of information. Okay, um, this was recently added to um, January 17th, the new law was passed. It takes effect March 23rd and must be complied by, no, March 26th, and must be, must be complied uh, by September 23rd with. And it basically just says, um, regardless of the what's, the ifs, the whens, the whys, um, everything is presumed to be a breach. And the burden of proof would lie in the companies that handle this information, such as Kent Records, okay? Um, or their client to prove there was no breach. Very, very difficult to do. Um, next. Information value. <clears throat> the Poneman Institute is a, th is a think tank based in Menlo Park, California in Traverse City. And they study data and breaches and ID theft and, and, and they attach value to information. Each record has a potential value of $283, okay? If this were records, okay, I don't know how many pages this is. I don't have my glasses on. How many pages is that, does it say? No, it doesn't say how many Figures, college. <laughs> In fact, you know, my books all have numbers, not C24. Um, anyway, let's say 200, okay, just for giggles. This potentially could be 200 records, okay, arguably. Uh, I would say they probably are. Um, so what's 200, for you math majors, times 283? A lot of money, <laughs> right? So if those were medical records, each one has a value of $322. So if you have a 100-page medical record, right, that's much easier for you math majors, okay? Um, yeah, that's worth a lot of bucks. So, a standard record box, which is 12, 12 by 12 by 15, right? 12 by 10. Okay, <laughs> close. Each one contains about 2,500 pieces of paper. That was a figure we got from our scanning department a few years ago. I don't know if that's, I mean, it seems pretty accurate to me. So if you do the math, 2,500 times 283, you come up with, for every box of records. Now that doesn't mean every box of records is worth 680 grand, okay? It means the information has a potential value of that. So that right there is almost 680,000 reasons identity thieves would like to see those records because they contain what? Information that can identify people. So HIPAA and high tech uh, deal with protecting the identities of people by protecting the information. Okay, <clears throat> $26 billion industry in 2011. I've not gotten 2012's uh, stats yet, but in 2010 and 2011, that number, that, that first sentence was always followed by the second one. Okay, the FBI reports it was more lucrative than the illegal drug trade. All right, it came from the government, so eh, I don't know if I trust it, but um, I don't hang around with people in the illegal drug trade, so I don't know how much money they make, so I don't know how to compare that with it. However, that number keeps going up every year, all right? 18.1 million uh, victims were affected by identity theft in 2011, and since 05, half a billion people. Uh, that number right now is 543 million, um, yeah, 543 million now. And in 2011 alone, over almost 31 records were breached, okay? Um, 
every four seconds an identity is stolen. So we've been at this for 90, 96 minutes times four seconds. That's how many records, okay, have been, or how many identities have been stolen since we've been in this room. Medical identity theft is the fastest growing type. It's grown 400% in 12 months, and ironically enough, in 2010, it grew exactly the same. So it's up 800% in 12 months, or 24 months. And 60% of identity theft of, of med records comes from paper. I know for a fact, because I used to work there, Kent Records stores, I don't know what the percentage is of medical record versus any other record, but they store lots and lots of medical records, okay? Um, what do you think some of the reasons somebody would want to steal your medical information are? Any, any ideas? Any guesses? Just fraudulent, insurance. fraudulent insurance claims, correct. That's one way. Yes? Claim SSI. Claim SSI. It's another great way. Yes? Uh, Social Security. Social Security, right. Right. Um, yes? Obtaining illegal prescriptions. Obtain, oh, obtaining illegal prescriptions. That's a good one. I got some stories about that, too. Um, um, one lady stole, stole 400 people's identity for narcotic prescriptions, okay? And she got a, like a nine-year prison sentence, so if she used all those drugs, she's probably still stoned after three years, but, um, and probably will be stoned for three more. Um, yeah, absolutely, but those are all great examples. Um, um, one that people typically don't mention is a very real one, um, and you've seen this on television. Um, if you pay close attention, like I do, to commercials. Um, yeah, I don't either, but I just happened to hear this and went, wow. Um, there's a pharmaceutical company out there that has a wonder drug, okay? And they say in the commercial, if you are unable to afford this medication, please contact us, the manufacturer, okay? Where there's danger there, is they've eliminated your doctor from that equation, okay? So imagine if a, 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 a pharmaceutical company, let's say that specializes in cancer medication, all right, they wouldn't have to make payouts to doctors to prescribe their medications, they would just deal directly with you. That saves them billions of dollars every year, okay? Um, I had a great friend of mine, I have a great friend of mine who, who worked for a, um, cancer drug manufacturer for 20 years. He didn't make it to 21 years. Um, and the reason he didn't make it, he told me, was because he would go in to give the doctors, the oncologists, free samples, okay? And I said, yeah, well, how come that kept you awake at night? He said, well, not only did I give them free samples, I paid them to prescribe our drugs. So he would go in and give them, and you know, you've all been in a doctor's office, you see the salesman wander in, and they're usually not happy to see him at the front desk but the doctor is usually pretty happy to see him, okay? Gives him his free samples, writes him a check to prescribe those things, and, and we're all good, all right? I'm not suggesting your doctors are unethical or are, are doing things illegally. That's just how that world works, okay? Lipitor, which my wife takes, um, $5 billion a year drug here in the United States, and it's not because Lipitor is so great. It's a cholesterol medication, okay? I know none of you are, but I'm overweight, all right? Oh, I'm not going to control my diet. Just give me a pill because controlling my diet is much too difficult. Lipitor, the reason it's such a popular drug is because the makers of Lipitor pay doctors more to prescribe it than the competitors of Lipitor, okay? It's not such a, you know, it's not that it's such a great drug. There are, in, in the past few years, have been Vioxx was one, Zoloft was another one for us older folks. Uh, we remember those wonder drugs that when the long-term study was complete, let me redefine that for you, we are in the middle of a long-term study of Lipitor to see what it actually does to the human body, and in another 10 years they're going to know what it actually does to the human body when all the humans that have taken it have all kinds of issues, all right? Vioxx and Zoloft, after, you know, so many years of being the wonder drug, you younger folks have never heard of it because they've yanked it off the market because too many people died from severe heart problems. So the long-term studies that the FDA um, has, 
they take place when people get the prescription. Those, you know, Lipitor wasn't tested for 20 years prior to it being introduced. It's now being tested on, on the guinea pigs. So, not to get off on a tangent. Next. <coughs> HIPAA. That's what I like to talk about. Anybody want to take a guess what HIPAA stands for? Anybody know? You were three-fifths incorrect. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Okay, it was created to help administrate health care. Um, privacy didn't come along until later. Um, but you would think with laws geared to reducing health insurance costs, um, you would think that would actually reduce your cost of health care, right? Um, anybody pay your own health care in here? Okay, has your cost of that health care gone down at all thanks to these laws? Yeah, mine neither. Um, the good part about HIPAA is that it continues to um, evolve and include changes um, to better protect this information, your health information, okay? Um, fact in the red flags rule, that's the Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act, so that's financial stuff. Uh, PCI DSS, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards, that's credit card stuff. GLBA and SOX, we'll, we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, next. Okay, HIPAA deals with protected health information. What makes information PHI? Great question, glad you asked. Um, how many of you are, how many of us are patients, right? We're all a patient somewhere, or have been one, or perhaps we're going to be one. What makes the information, protected health information, is your name plus one or more of these other 18 identifiers, okay? Your name plus your zip code, for instance, is PHI. It has nothing to do with your health. Your name plus your birth date, let's say, okay? When you were born has nothing to do with your health. Your name plus your cell phone number is PHI. Fax numbers, your name plus your social security number. Again, that has nothing to do with your health, but yet it's called protected health information. Oh, here you go. Medical record numbers and health insurance beneficiary numbers. Those have something to do with health. Um, your name plus your checking account number is PHI. Your name plus your driver's license number, okay? And by the way, what medical information is on your driver's license without looking? Donor, eyes, whether you wear, not, not whether you have them, but whether you have correction, you know, I got contacts, so. Height and weight, and for the record, on my driver's license, I am taller, because I'm kind of short, and I'm lighter because I had got to fill that in. Okay, they never weighed me, so. Right? I was too late on mine. They must have given me a pass. Well, they probably just, oh, never mind. Um, yes, probably. And what else might be on there? Zip code, right? Address, birth date, right? So it's full of PHI by this definition. Um, your name plus the VIN number on your car and your license plate number on your car. Your name plus your device identifier number. How many of you have one of these devices? Dumb question, but what do you call these really? Fashion. <laughs> yes. We, we call these, what, cell phones, right? How many of you actually talk on these? Right? That they're really computers you can talk through. Okay, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, websites, um, email addresses, that sort of thing. Um, biometric identifiers, that's the cool James Bond stuff where you, you know, walk up to the bank door and you put your eyeball up to it and, the, you know, the door opens up. Um, uh, retina scan? Retina scan, yes. Thank you. I like my definition better but I didn't go to college. So, um, 
the full face photos, okay? That's also on your driver's license. How about pictures of tattoos plus your name? That's protected health information. So, if that isn't ridiculous enough, any other unique identifying number, characteristic, or code except the unique code assigned by the investigator to code the data. So that, line, that list is going to grow, okay? But my sense is all of these things, for one reason or another, probably if they were, if, if any law, there was no way for the government to, co uh, to collect revenue. So if I stole your driver's license, for instance, I wouldn't steal the female's driver's license because, no. Um, if, I, if I stole yours, okay, and he, he caught me, after I get out of the hospital from the beating I received from him, that was pretty much over, right? It was a petty crime. Um, I had a black eye or whatever. Had him glue in some new chiclets and, you know, go about my business. But now, it's a violation of federal law, which means it's covered under all the fine and penalty structures that are in place for HIPAA, okay? A lot of these really didn't generate any revenue, and now they do, okay? Any questions about this? stuff okay next this is an old one too this was recently changed um, personal responsibility Ooh, personal responsibility okay the civil fines and penalties for HIPAA violations there are civil fines and criminal fines the civil fines are all monetary okay it's all dollars so the lowest uh, uh, level is tier A then it goes to B C and D but for a single violation, which is simply a mistake, um, this has changed. It went from, it can still be a hundred bucks. I mean, they can find you a hundred bucks, you know, just simply by making a mistake. Um, this was changed from 25 to 50 grand. All of these were changed to 50,000, okay? So, oh, what a deal. Instead of a hundred grand, you only got to pay half that. Instead of 250 grand, you, you know, government just saved you 200,000, you know? Um, but they changed the cap on all of these to 50,000. They still have this cap of a million and a half for willful neglect, but each one of these on a calendar year now have a $1.5 million for each violation. Okay, so they can fine you 100 bucks, up to 50 grand, but in the case of a records management company who makes hundreds of deliveries every day, if, if, if they're not doing things in a proper way, and, and mistakes keep happening. Why? Unauthorized acquisition. People are getting things they shouldn't get, therefore they see things they shouldn't see, and then they disclose things they shouldn't disclose, all because they got something in error, okay? So Andrew and his crew at Kent Records have quite the obligation to make sure that their people, not that they're perfect, but they just limit their mistakes. Because if they get fined 10 times a year, yeah, they'll get fined 100 bucks probably, may get fined 50 grand, but they could get fined a million and a half times 10. Okay? So the government is trying its best to limit these mistakes or errors um, or the caliber of people you hire to work for you by impacting your pocketbook. Well, okay, they can afford it, right? They're a company, after all. They got 77 people. Oh, they got five locations. They can afford a million and a half bucks. Not without sending a lot of those, uh, those 77 employees home forever, okay? That's going to impact jobs. Not only that, the ownership of the group, the way these fines are structured, the, let's just say for simple math, if, you, if, if, if they got hit with a $100,000 fine and I was the employee who was making the mistakes, the company would pay the 100000 Each owner potentially would pay 100000 So there's 100000 times the four owners. Me as the employee is also subject to that same fine. Well, on what they pay me? No way. I can't pay no $100,000 fine. The government has also solved that little dilemma so that you don't have to you know, worry about how you're going to pay for that because what they do historically, and I have the evidence, not with me, but um, they will take everything you have and call it good. Okay, they'll take your house, they'll take your cars, they'll take your bicycles, they'll take fishing boats with holes in them, they'll take your silverware, they'll take your, your, your favorite sweaters, 
They'll take your spoons, they'll take your cups. I know he's a sweater guy. Okay? So that's where, regardless of what you make, you still have a personal responsibility if you make mistakes. Okay? And that ought to scare you. But hopefully it won't scare you enough to not take a job being a records manager. Okay? Um, everyone has risk with what they do, and this is just another law. So uh, don't let that freak you out from pursuing a career in records management. Back to red flags rule, okay? That was enact, enacted to help prevent identity theft and created fraud alerts and active duty alerts uh, for military families. You can imagine over the past, how many years we've been at the, in this latest war, um, identity thieves, I mean typically who would go into the war, right? The husband or the dad. So the, the dad normally is the person who pays the bills not in my house, so I'm good with that. But all of a sudden now, the wife who's left behind with, you know, perhaps some kids, she has to make sure the mortgage is paid and, or the rent's paid and car payments and all that. Well, that's easy prey for identity thieves. So these laws came about to help kind of curb that. Um, um, fraud alerts. Anybody here have a credit card, right? Yeah. Um, my credit card has a great service that will alert me when there's any unusual spending um, or attempted spending. Now that's a great service to have. If you have a credit card, I recommend you get it. They're usually free. Okay. Let me remind you to remember you have it. Okay. Here's a here's a no kidding. It really happened to me story. I was in Phoenix. I travel a lot doing what I do. I was at my sister's place, and my wife was here, and they needed a new TV. I went to turn on the TV. I had a day off and I was hanging out with my sister and her husband. So of course I got to watch TV. It was all snowy and nasty. And I said to my wife, I called her up. I said, Hey, how about for the wedding present? I run down to Walmart and I buy him a little flat screen. She said, fine. She looked it up online. She said, I thought I got him for a few hundred dollars. I said, okay. Borrowed my sister's car, went down there. Standing at the uh, cash register, for some reason at Walmart, and I'm noticing more and more at every other store I go into, electronics are special. They have their own checkout. Okay? The electronics, they don't want you wandering through the store. You have to buy it from the electronics cash register. Okay? So I go up there, whipped out my credit card. There you go. Had the, had the TV in the cart. It was a 32-inch TV. And, of course, this young lady, she runs my credit card. You know, and I'm guessing... That retail giant may not pay their people very much money. Okay, I don't know what she was making. Sweet young lady. She swiped my card and went, eh. Really? Okay. Ma'am, try that again. She gets paid by the hour. She don't care. So she did it again. She said, sorry. Andrew knows my level of patience. Okay? Not very tolerant. I start to, are you done? Um, no, <laughs> just, just kidding. Um, so I start to get, I can feel myself getting warm, starting to, whew, about to go berserk on this young lady, and my phone vibrates. My computer I can talk to, okay? Who is it? It's my wife. Great timing. What? Don't ever answer the phone, what, okay? She said, I just got a call from Visa. Um, they wanted to know if you were in Phoenix buying something at a Walmart. I told them you were, so I uh, have the person try the card again, and I'll hold on the line until this is worked out. I went, hang on a sec. Can you try that again? <laughs> worked just fine. I said, thanks, I'll call you in a minute. Okay, hung up, and that was it. So I got, got done, got it loaded in the car, then had to, sheepishly call my wife and say, honey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to answer the phone that way. She laughed, but at me, not with me. Um, she knows you. She knows me, absolutely. Um, how many of you think you do a really good job of protecting your own information? Three, three and a half, because your hand wasn't up very high. Um, the rest of you just admitted you do a pretty crappy job then, right? Okay, 
for those of you who raised your hand, I would have to disagree with you, okay? Um, and, and here's why. Tell me if any of this sounds familiar. Let's just say, for instance, we are not here. Let's just say we are at O'Toole's. That's where Andrew and I went for lunch. Nice little hamburger, I don't know what it is, a pub? Hamburger place. Hamburger place, yes. Irish hamburgers, that's what you buy there. Yep. Instead of you know, being here doing this, let's just say we're all hanging out. We're family, we're friends, whatever it might be. Um, at the end of a meal, or during a meal, let's just say we're all hanging out, we're getting to know each other, we're chatting it up, having a few cold Diet Cokes, okay? At some point during the meal, the server, apparently it's illegal to call them waiters or waitresses anymore, okay? But at some point, the server will come over and will kind of look around, okay? Waiting for one of us to go, what? I'll pay for it, okay? They're happy when they find that individual. They usually will then hand you a black booklet about this size, right? We then will reach into our pockets, we'll pull out the card, and being good little puppets, you got to put it in the window, right? Half sticking out, because apparently that's the only way you can indicate, hey, I'm ready. You can, because they always say, I will take this when? Whenever you're ready. So we play along and we put it in the cute little window. But we can't tell them we're ready, I guess. We have to show them. They run off with this, okay? Anybody here a server? No, but not currently? Anybody related to a server? Okay, don't take this personal. Okay? But here's what really happens. Server, normally, total stranger, okay, walks off with your credit card, okay? And we just are, are hanging out, we're happy, we're talking some more, we're really not paying particular attention, okay? Five, 10, 15 minutes goes by, server comes back, okay? Sets that down in front of you, always with a smile. Have you ever noticed? They're always smiling. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. It's been great waiting on you folks. Please come back. Love to see you again. We, you know, feel warm and fuzzy about that, that they actually care. They don't. Okay? But let me suggest that may not be the truth of what happened. Okay? If that individual sometimes were honest with you when they came back to the table, okay, they put that down in front of you, a big old smile on their face, and they say, thank you very much. You've given us your credit card information, name, expiration date, and the all-important three-digit code on the back. And after work, me and my coworkers are going to buy a whole bunch of cool stuff. You're going to pay for it. Please come back. We'll see you next week. Okay? And we go, hey, you're welcome. And then, Excuse me, Tom, just to clarify, not all servers. Not all servers. servers. Okay, good. Um, then we pay them an extra money called the tip on top of that, okay? Now, is that ridiculous? Absolutely. Um, but that stuff happens all the time. And I use that stuff in trainings all the time with all the breaches that I am aware of where that is exactly the case, or you drive through Taco Bell and you throw your card through the machine and it sends it to a computer in Holland, this is a true story, and four individuals went to prison because two individuals were paid 10 grand a piece to put skimming devices in Taco Bells, okay? <coughs> Why do we use these cards, whether they're debit or credit? What? Convenience. Convenience, okay. One of these, okay? I go into a gas station. It is no more convenient for me to pay with a card than it is for cash. Matter of fact, it's less convenient. Now, I can't buy one of these at the pump. You need to have a card at the pump. Good luck stuffing cash in that pump. Ain't gonna happen, right? So when you have to go into a gas station, It's actually way more convenient 
it's no more, it's no less convenient because you're paying with a card. You have to stand in line, same amount of time. You have the same length of time interacting with the attendant. Okay, it's actually less convenient because when you're done, they give you a receipt. You have to shove it in your pocket. Okay, then when you get home, you got to enter it in your checkbook or write it in your checkbook. Anyone remember this stuff? Yogi Berra said cash, it's almost as good as money. Okay? My wife will walk into a gas station, that's inconvenient. Okay? Not convenient. She will buy one of these, swipe the card, it takes her five dollars worth of effort. That's not convenient. I walk in with, a, with two one dollar bills and throw the change in the little take a penny, leave the penny thing. That's convenient. If I disagree, convenience is the issue. But like I say, sometimes, you know, you have, to, you have to pay before you pump. That's convenient with these cards. Other than that, I really can't think of it, any other scenario being convenient. Inconvenience is carrying the coins. So instead you carry a bunch of cards. <laughs> You're still carrying stuff. Perhaps. Perhaps. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Um, well, the comment was it that that if you had cards in your in your wallet and your wallet was stolen, then yeah, you just have a card you have to cancel. But if you had a hundred dollars in cash in there, it's gone. So yeah, there's some validity to that. I can't disagree with that. Um, but but you see what I'm saying with this stuff is we don't protect our own information. We give it out. How many like to shop online? Okay? I love it so I don't have to go to the store. Except I love going to Kohl's. Okay? But um, how many of you have read the privacy statements on these websites? None of you. He he would. Okay. They're usually QB eight pages long. Okay. They're usually a thousand pages long, and the only words you understand are A and the. After that, you have no idea. But I don't read them because I just want to buy the thing I want to buy. I don't care what they do with my information. Okay? We throw all kinds of information in the trash every single day. Credit card applications, anyone? Normally, you tear them in half. And I would swear the credit card companies are in cahoots with ID thieves because what I found more and more, and I always check these, of course, it has your name and address where it was sent to, but usually on the opposite side, is another thing of your name and address. So you've taken one piece of, Id of identity, you've torn it in half, creating two, and you throw them in the same trash bin. Okay? Just watch for that stuff. Um, 1988, the United States Supreme Court passed a law um, that said that um, dumpster diving, 100% legal. Okay? So if ID thief wants to, uh, no, I'm not. I'm just saying. I'll, I'll play one. Um, if I want to come steal some, some cool information from you, when you push that little dumpster out to the, to the curb tonight and you see my legs sticking out, kicking, okay, because I'm digging around for stuff, um, and you call the police, they're going to pretty much laugh at you, okay, because it's legal for what I'm doing. The reason they passed that law, they figured it this way. You assume... They assume that you know as an intelligent citizen that when you push that out to the road, it is now public information. Okay? Andrew mentioned document destruction, shredding of hard drives, all that stuff. Um, that's part of the life cycle of a record. Okay? A record is created on the day it's born. Okay? It's created. It has a lifespan, a useful lifespan. When that lifespan has, has ended, then um, the destruction of it is its funeral, okay? So it's, it's, it's destroyed. Um, everything really has a retention. Um, I don't know what they are, but there are federal laws and state laws that uh, dictate that stuff. So, 
Red flags rule originally, originally defined for financial institutions, which were banks and credit unions, and creditors, which were credit card companies at the time. Um, this is still in the courts, um, as far as I know. They're really battling over what is a creditor, okay? It used to be credit card companies. <clears throat> what they want to do is say a creditor is anyone who provides products or services for later payment, okay? That really is about 90% of America is providing a product or a service for later payment. So all these businesses that typically wouldn't have to abide by the red flags rule if this goes through, which I doubt it will, um, my opinion, they're going to have to abide by that when they're not a financial institution. So just want you to be aware of that. Next. PCI DSS was created actually by the charge card companies um, and the data security program uh, to help prevent credit card theft. Okay? Has anybody here ever been the victim of identity theft? Have you? Can I ask what happened? No way. People actually steal that stuff, really? Awesome. Is it, uh, is it hard for you to deal with all of this, or is it pretty easy? Well, it's pretty hard. It's got in the 70-day monitoring thing, but you would want to see it from time to time. Really? Yeah, you know, but uh, cases are different from that. Okay. Well, I wish you the best on that. Yeah. Credit card yeah, you just of the credit card. Oh, that's convenient though, right? Convenient. Right? You, you know, you go to the iPhone, you know, the Apple store. There's nothing on their shelves. They don't even have shelves, I don't think. Um, I ordered mine online. I don't know. But from what I hear, they go and, you know, people are carrying around iPads and iPhones, and they just stick the little reader, and like you suggested. It's done. You've just bought your thing, whatever that thing is. Um, what happens to the information on that thing at the end of every day? Okay. Oh, we trust people will take care of it. No, they're not going to. There's a market for that information. Okay. Um, if you take credit cards as payments, you must comply. Um, compliance is governed by the total annual number of transactions performed. And, and in Kent Records' case, they this acquisition. One of the acquisitions they recently have, have done, um, I understand one of their companies takes credit cards for payments. Um, so I've had a conversation with one of the owners that I know very, very well um, about being PCI compliant because um, if they fail to do that, they're going to be in trouble. Okay? It's cheaper to just be compliant. So next. GLBA, Graham Leach Bliley, opened up the market among banking companies, security companies, and insurance companies. Um, prior to GLBA, the Glass-Steagall uh, Act prohibited an institution, a bank, from acting as a combination of a bank plus anything else. Uh, uh, a bank was just a bank, okay? Um, uh, GLBA now allows a bank to sell insurance. They, they allow banks to um, offer outside uh, services from that, that aren't part of the bank, but uh, the bank is a, uh, the bank can sell you things, okay? Um, and that's okay, uh, but it mandates the financial institutions that obtain non-public non personal information through the normal course of their business must develop precautions to ensure the security and confidentiality, uh, confidentiality of customers and records and information. So, um, again, that's a great component. Um, and to Kent Records, companies like Kent Records, the security, privacy, and confidentiality, that's what they do, okay? That's what they provide that the companies that you may go to work for or currently work for, you can't do yourselves for anywhere near the cost that they can do it for you, okay? It's a beautiful thing. Um, and to protect against unauthorized access to or use of such records, these include secure storage, disposal, and sharing of confidential information. Um, how many of you in this room today
have ever Googled yourself? Oh, yeah, that's fun, isn't it? Were you surprised or not about the amount of information you saw about yourself? You weren't? Okay. Uh, uh, somewhat. I was expecting more. Of course you were. <laughs> it won't be long. He'll be able to show me the more because I'll go home and create it. <laughs> oh, that's right. This is recorded. Um, yeah, it, it's crazy the amount of information out there about each one of us. And, and we largely don't think about that when we are, are, you know, I go like this, boom, a four-digit code, get rid of my sister's text, Facebook, yes, Facebook, it's awesome, right? Social media is awesome. I use it for my business page. See me afterwards, I'll tell you what the, what the name of it is, okay? What happens to all the information you freely share on here? Where are the photos that you freely share on here stored at? And, and what are the measures of protecting and keeping those private? How many of you read uh, the Facebook privacy policy? Other than Andrew. Okay. I'm, I'm going to put you and Andrew in the same group here because every time I ask a technical question, you raise your hands just like Andrew. No. Absolutely, absolutely. That was going to be my next statement, that everything you, pay, uh, that, that you post on Facebook belongs to Facebook, not you. Oh, but it's my Facebook. Nothing about Facebook is yours. Zero, including your password. Okay? Um, LinkedIn, I'm a member of LinkedIn, okay? It's a great business tool. It's a great way to pimp yourself and your services. Look us up. Look us up. LinkedIn was hacked, five million passwords. Okay? But nothing on LinkedIn belongs to me or you, it belongs to LinkedIn. Okay? But we trust everyone. Andrew gave me a great book. He was one when I worked for him. I worked directly for him for what, two years, I think? That's not bad. It seemed like ten. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but he was always coming in my office saying, hey, man, you've got to read this chapter in this book, and he'd give it to me, and I'd read it and give it back to him. Uh, the Art of Deception, great book by Mr. Mitnick, right? Kevin, Kevin Mitnick. Um, proof positive that we all trust everybody all the time, regardless. Okay? You trust the people who call you on, the, on your computers that you can talk through that are taking a, uh, a survey, and you trust that that the person at the bank, and you, we trust everybody. And he proves over and over and over to the point of, I got tired of reading the book. This gentleman was so scary that he had a prosecutor and a judge convinced he could launch warheads by using telephone signals by dialing a number and hitting, and hitting keys. And he put it in solitary confinement. And he's got another, a new book out called Ghost in the Wires, which is a book he was able to write once the statute of limitations ran out, <laughs> he was being, you know, thrown to federal prison for hacking. Um, he, he wrote uh, Soviet and Death Force. Just fascinating book. Fascinating book. Um, I would encourage you all to read some of that. Um, just example after example of how you and I, because we are society, right, we trust everybody all the time. So, um, next. Sarbanes-Oxley. Developed as a result of, oh, Enron, okay? Um, deals pretty much with the standards, a new set of standards, well, they're not new anymore, for all U.S. public traded uh, boards, uh, uh, company management and public accounting firms. Um, but publicly traded companies, their employees, their officers, and their owners, excuse me, including holders of more than 10% of the outstanding common shares, um, are impacted as well. So this, uh, this category would include CPAs. So the companies that your companies hire to, you know, to do their taxes and things, they're on the hook with this and they have to abide by it. So same as uh, the chief financial officers or in the finance department, attorneys who work for or have as clients publicly traded companies, okay, 
and brokers, dealers, investment bankers, and financial analysts who work for these companies. So it, again, so let's go back to HIPAA. What does it have in common, okay? That's an individual, that's an individual, an individual, an individual, personal responsibility, okay? So you can be greatly impacted by how your company that you work for, um, or as a record manager, for instance, or an administrator, the laws you really pay attention to and, and comply with. So compliance is a big deal today. Um, I didn't gab as long as Andrew, sorry, he's still got 40 minutes, but he does a pretty good song and dance if you want to kill some time. Any questions? Um, the, the don't let compliance stuff scare you from, from taking a job or quitting a job. Just, I want you to be aware of the risks involved. Um, but there's risk in everything. There's risk when we leave here today. Okay? Um, in my training sessions, I always compare HIPAA uh, to the speed limit because when we leave here, those of us who are driving, or if you're riding, at some point when you pull out of the parking ramp or wherever you're parked, it's not going to be too long before you encounter a sign, right? That sign says speed limit and has a number. Contrary to what I think most of the time, that number is not a suggestion. Okay? It's, it's the law. Whether I choose to obey it or not, um, that's a separate issue, okay? But that's the law. HIPAA is a law, SOX, GLBA, they're laws. Whether we choose to obey them or not is, is a choice that either you're going to make um, in this particular case of driving, or perhaps on a compliance front, your companies are going to make. Um, I can tell you from personal experience that the more you violate that number on that sign by, the bigger the fine, right? At some point, the state of Michigan could intervene and severely restrict my ability to freely drive. If I continually get speeding tickets, they're going to at some point go, you know what, you can just drive to work and back. Okay? HIPAA is the same way, only the government can really step in and they can take away the whole car. The whole car could be the company. All right? Um, if you continually violate these laws, thus causing breaches, which is identity theft in the whole nine yards, um, they can be started, the state attorney general in conjunction with Office of Civil Rights can come in and literally shut your uh, business down. Um, don't know too many cases that has happened, but with the imposition of those high fines, that can shut a business down in a hurry. So, um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Hey, Tom. Yes. With that hip, uh, with that hip uh, I know I go to a doctor a lot and make a sign a hippo form, mm -hmm. make a sign an empty form on all that. Do you implement all of that, or what um, do that, or what? No, most of those places are are aware of what they need to do and they need to provide you that little document, that, that little HIPAA thing. You have to sign it once a year. Um, it typically contains their notice of privacy practices, which means that will tell you what they're going to do with your information. Um, you'd be appalled if you read that, just so you know. Most of the time, um, there's a large hospital here in town that um, they post theirs on a wall and one day because, you know, when you go to a doctor, um, sometimes because apparently their time is much more valuable than yours, you have to sit there and wait for a while, okay? So I'm reading this thing going, are you kidding me? Because what it said on there was, it basically said don't expect us to keep your, your information private, okay? It basically, yeah, I know, it's, I look at things like that. Um, it said they can sell and market your, you know, they can give you contact they can put your name on an email list and sell to people. And you just, because you trust them, because your health is in their best interest. No. The question They're to ask in business be, to make money. What happens if I don't sign this? Will you deny me medical service? Typically they will. So. Although they won't. No, they may say, no, but we have to have that for our records. You go, mm, no. And they'll probably still see you. Oftentimes I've... Uh, re Certain, certain ones I've refused to sign. Or yeah. say, I'm not comfortable signing that, but oh, okay. They don't care one way or the other. Yeah. I go and they throw it in the can. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, questions or anything, email me, email Andrew. Um, it's been fun, thank you.
Pardon? Back up to your uh, situation with the oncology report. Yes, ma'am, oncology report. Did the person who read the report and uh, sent that to their neighbor have any repercussions? Um, that's not what I understand. They were already in a medical facility, so they should have been under HIPAA ruling and not known not to disclose anything. The, the question was... On the oncology example I used early on, was any repercussions taken? Um, what that indicated to me, and it's indicated to me all the time, um, I question people's trainings that they've received. Okay, on a grand scale, um, our daughter two years ago had our second grandson. Okay. We're sitting in this room. There was about 8,000 people in this room about the size of, you know, we're all. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the floor in the corner. And I'm sweating because there's so many people in the room. That they sucked all the air out of the room. I was just nervous. And I'm sitting there with my oldest grandson. My daughter says, hey, Dad, reach up on the counter. I'm like. She says, no, really. So I got up and I reached. Three reports, okay? Three yellow pieces of paper, all the same report, whatever the report was. I go, okay, what are these? She goes, well, those are my reports. Okay. Put them back on the counter. She says, now, Dad, look at those again. <sighs> She's grinning, okay? Because she knows I just get blood pressure goes up. Three different ladies who had children the same time as my daughter, I had one report for each of them. They weren't even my daughter's reports. They brought them in and says, here's your reports. Okay, so I calmly, not very, go to the nurse's station. I said, I need to talk to who's in charge here. And this lady who was much bigger than me, she goes, she goes, well, I put my glasses on and I went, I need to talk to whoever's in charge here, okay? She says, why? So she went to get the person in charge. Lady come out and I said, you know, here's my card. What it said on my card was Kent Record Management Compliance Consultant, okay? That was my, my last title there, I think. I said, you know, we store records for this department. Can you explain to me why my daughter, I said, my daughter's room's right there. She goes, yeah, it's okay. Tell me my daughter's name. And she looked at me, you know, gave me that tilted head sort of. Mm. I said, no, please. So she did. And what room is she in? Please tell me. She goes, that one. Her, her tone really changed. I went, okay, I'm, I'm good with that. I said, but why did she get this report? I don't know this lady. And this report, and this report for her to view. I said, do you understand if I took a little picture of these and sent these off to my buddy that used to work for WZZM? And you don't know what I was thinking of, right? Okay. Imagine if that hit the press. I could sue the the bejesus out of you, <laughs> or scare the out of them anyway, okay? I said, but I'm not going to do that. She says, she called this young lady over, and she goes, we need to have a little meeting. I says, whoa, 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 whoa. Look, this ain't about getting anybody in trouble or getting anybody fired. Please don't. I said, if you fire her, I'm going to have a problem with it. I didn't want anybody fired. This is an indication to me that you received some really crappy training. You should know better. You should make sure she knows better. Okay? Oh, but we have the best training. No, you don't. If you do, the wrong people have the best training. Okay? So, I still haven't been able to crack that nut to go in there and provide some HIPAA training for those folks. Probably never will. Um, it's just paper, right? It's just paper. All Q88 pages of it or whatever this is. QR8, okay? So, and I understand we all get complacent. I don't care if you're him or me. Well, I don't know if you get complacent. 
Um, he'll just go teach another class at Davenport when he gets complacent. But he's a good dude. Um, it's just paper. I get that. You just have to be careful with this stuff. You have to be careful with the stuff you carry around in your wallet. You have to be careful with the texts you send. Okay, discoverable and recoverable as evidence in a court of law. Nothing you've ever deleted is deleted. You all know that, Another right? Another suggestion that I'd like to make, uh, I was at the uh, Michigan Clerks Association yesterday doing a presentation on information governance, which is kind of the new hot topic of how records management could potentially evolve. And there was an attorney there, and she gave some really good advice that uh, I think I would wish I would have had early in my career, and I know Tom definitely should have had early in his career, was um, if you don't have to write it down or text it or email it, don't. Ask Brett Favre. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. It it's is, evidence. It is okay to still have conversations one-on-one. -on -one. Now, of course, we're recorded, so it's a little different. But if I have a problem with you or in the scenario that she gave <coughs> where a police officer had crashed into a house and hurt someone while on duty, all of the texts that went back and forth in the police department about, well, did you hear about so-and-so, officer, so I'm not surprised, can't believe it took this long, et cetera, et cetera. LOL. Those were all discoverable. <laughs> those were all discoverable, okay? If that information isn't recorded and stored somewhere that's retrievable and it's just talk, you, you can't get that information back. Now, of course, they can subpoena people and they can put you on the stand, but there has to be proof that it actually occurred. Okay? <clears throat> if no one's going to come out and say, oh, I talked bad about so-and-so officer, but it was there. It didn't have to. It was already there. So you can imagine how that turned out. So good rule of thumb, if you will, <coughs> when you're typing out corporate thumb. emails or, or texting, um, especially if you're working for someone on a personal phone, a lot of that can be discoverable. There are plenty of cases where personal devices or personal computers are subpoenaed for information that you might have possibly done work on, and those computers and those phones don't come back until the case is done. Right. Okay? And if you've got other information on there that's not good, that could be liable from a criminal standpoint, uh, you might find yourself in hot water. So just be careful. Um, Facebook is very convenient, as Tom pointed out. Um, Twitter, uh, we haven't talked, but social media is an entirely different conversation. Not only do you not own it, it's publicly available. <coughs> the uh, Library of Congress is keeping all of these. So whatever you're tweeting, Just so you know. messages, private messages, if you're using that forum, it's being kept. Now, fortunately for you, you're one of billions and billions <laughs> and billions. So you just have to know that that information is out there. So if you follow my Twitter feed, if you follow me on LinkedIn, <coughs> and you look at my LinkedIn posts or my Twitter posts, they aren't much about the burgers that I ate or the fact that Tom and I had a spirited conversation about something and how I felt. We've had many of those. Uh, personal information. It's not <coughs> there. It's just going to be more generic company-related information. Um, for the purpose of that, that's all I limit it to. I'm very careful. If I'm going to have a personal conversation or a, a concern, I'm going to do it face-to-face. -face. Um, of course, I learned that with my wife. That's why we do it. Well, very true, and, and, and I can attest to that because anytime he talks to me, he calls, okay? At least I hear your voice. Um, but we've gotten so accustomed. People in my generation, and there are only a few of us in this room that are my age or, or so, um, whatever happened to calling grandma or writing grandma a letter? Instead, and I challenge you all because I know none of you are part of this crowd, next time you go to the mall, when you walk in the door, start counting. How many people are this? And you'll quit counting by the time, I guarantee, by the time you're 100 feet in the door. Because you're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's everybody. How many aren't? Okay, maybe you're going to go 1, water fountain, still texting. 2, <laughs> 3. What's that? Uh, there was a, a story of a woman who was texting and she was walking and she went right into a water fountain. Yeah. Well, she probably pulled her, her scuba gear app. Yeah. And <laughs> Yeah, I Are don't there know. any other questions before we wrap this up so you guys can get back to your program? <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, you guys.